Um, hello there. Uh, my name is Robert Sutherland, and I would like to welcome everyone to the second in this series of Start the Week seminars being put on by Terra Firma Chambers. Further information about all the seminars in the series can be found on terrafirmachambers.com. These seminars are being recorded and uploaded to YouTube. If you know anyone who might be interested in the seminar but couldn't join us today, please let them know. In addition to the joy of being able to watch these seminars as many times as you, times as you want on YouTube, copies of slides and handouts to accompany the talks will be emailed out to those who have signed up for the seminar. Today's speakers are myself and Mark Lazarevich. Um, there will be a chance to ask questions using the Zoom question and answer uh, function. Uh, we will answer the questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, the series of uh, talks today is that Mark is going to speak first on uh, the subject of common good. I will then be speaking next on the community rights to buy, and then I'll hand back to Mark, who will talk about uh, asset transfer. Uh, Mark has a varied civil practice, which includes property, environmental, local government, human rights, quality law and public law. He is well placed to talk about common good and asset transfer. I'm now going to hand over to Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, and uh, good afternoon. And as a preliminary, I should remind you, as Robert has said, there will be a handout, and everything I'm going to say in my presentation will be in the handout, so that may save you from need to take uh, too many notes. But the common good. Uh, I start with a description which is in the first page of the book by Andrew Ferguson on common good law. I place it up here because it's a good description of what the Common Good Fund is, and also because it's worthwhile mentioning the book that um, Mr. Ferguson wrote, it is very much uh, the leading text uh, on this uh, area uh, of law and practice. You'll see in that definition that the Common Good is a fund of money and assets. It can include money and investments, civic regalia, artworks, and much else. But the most significant element of a Common Good and the source of most legal question and disputes is land, and that normally includes the buildings on it. And there's a recent case, Guild against Angus, which uh, makes that principle very clear, and that's uh, cited at some length in the handout. It is a fund which is formally owned by a borough. Uh, a boroughs were established over a period of almost uh, a thousand years. Uh, they were the unit of local government in most urban communities in Scotland during a very long period until a local government reorganization in 1975. Their various names which uh, uh, I've listed there. Uh, it's uh, an interesting history but it's only of relevance uh, for today's talk because common good property can exist today only if it originated in the common good of one of those boroughs. There is not therefore a common good for areas of one of today's local authorities, which was not comprised within one of those boroughs, where there were, I should say, certain powers given under the local government Scotland Act in 1947 for uh, areas which didn't come within the common good, but I won't talk about that uh, today. Those boroughs were abolished as separate units, as I said, in 1975. Their common good funds were transferred to the successor local authorities in 75, and then again in 1994, they were transferred by the legislation then to the successor authorities, the current local authorities. And they are required to administer that property, having regard to the interests of the inhabitants of the area to which a common good relates or in the case of Aberdeen, Dundee, Edinburgh, Glasgow, to, to, having regard to the interests of all the inhabitants of the area. So there's a slight uh, anomaly there, but if you are in one of those council areas of four uh, uh, older cities, uh, then uh, even though not all the areas were within boroughs before 1994, uh, the interest that you have to take account of is for the inhabitants of all of those four city areas. Should be noted that the requirement is to have regard to the interests of, it doesn't specify it actually has to be the benefit of, nor there is any requirement um, that the property itself should be situated uh, within the former borough uh, area. Since 2017, the extent of common good property has become much more widely 
known because of the requirements of the Community Empowerment Scotland Act, which required local authorities to establish and maintain a public register of property held by the authority as part of a common good. If you look at those lists, it's evident that the approach taken by different local authority varies. And it should be noted that the register itself is not the definitive list of a common good property in the area. If you look at those lists, you will find that some local authorities make it clear that they are now uh, very much producing their list as a work in progress, subject in some cases to further investigation. And the underlying principle is uh, the important one, which was established in the 1944 case, which is on the slide, a very important one, which is that all borough property, insofar as it has not been acquired by statutory powers uh, or forms part of a separate trust estate administered by the boroughs, must form part of a common good of a borough. And that's been uh, endorsed by later uh, cases as well. Now, that's a description which uh, at first sight could alarm some of those who direct and manage local authorities. It's a very broad uh, description, all of our property except insofar as it's uh, acquired by statutory powers or separate trust estate. But it should be borne in mind that much of the land previously acquired by a borough is actually going to have been acquired by under various statutory powers, for example, housing, be it housing for rent or housing, regeneration, education, parks, recreation, public uh, halls, water and drainage, fire stations, and of course, many areas of local authorities will not have been in a former borough. So there's quite a lot of exceptions to the general principle. Nevertheless, it's a good point, uh, starting point, if you're uh, looking at whether a particular area of land or indeed property is likely to be within the uh, common good. In any uh, event, what happens if an authority um, wants to change the use of the property beyond that permitted by the founding deed or its customary use or indeed to dispose of it. Some of the older cases uh, suggest that property could be regarded as being removed from a common good with no great difficulty if the activities could be undertaken elsewhere and two of the well, once not particularly old 1997, but in all the case 1937 and 97 case are, uh, are on there. But the court's more recent approach has left no doubt. Scots law has been zealous in the protection of common good property, even in cases in which the local authority proposed to put that common good land to what was prima facie a reasonable and productive uh, community use. Uh, the courts will be very hesitant uh, to accept uh, that property which was in the uh, common good should be allowed to be removed from the common good without specific authority. So an authority which seeks to change the use or in the terms uh, of uh, the common good legislation must therefore rely on the statutory provisions governing the disposal of common good property. Now, these, as you will see, relate to land only, but it is, of course, land that is the main focus of interest in disputes or legal questions. The city of relevant provisions there. Very important, but there's some points of interest with respect to which land, no question arises as to the right or the authority uh, to alienate. That's the end of subsection one. If there's no question as to the right of the authority to alienate that common good uh, property, then the other provisions of the Act relating to disposing of land with general rules about how you can dispose of property uh, will apply. So you still have to follow the general rules of how you uh, deal with your land if you wish to dispose or, or sell of it. But the interest, of course, is in those areas where, going to subsection two, second line, a question arises as to the right of the authority to alienate. If a question arises, they may apply to a court of session of a sheriff to authorise them to appropriate or dispose of a land, and the court or sheriff may, as they see fit, 
authorise the appropriation or disposal subject to conditions. And in subsection three, they may impose a condition requiring that the local authority shall provide in substitution for the land proposed to be appropriated or disposed of other land to be used for the same purpose for which the former land was used. But note that is not the only condition that the court can apply. The court has a pretty free hand, or indeed a, a, a totally free hand, to decide what conditions to uh, uh, set for such disposal. But the court doesn't have to set any conditions at all, nor indeed, if you read the section carefully, does a court have to require that the land is actually retained within the common good fund it can allow, and frequently does in these cases, the fund of a property to be removed effectively from the common good uh, 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 property. I should say again, though, that disposals of all property, including common good property, still have to be undertaken within the general rules applicable to local government finance. For example, uh, there was an Aberdeen case again in the notes in 1990 where the common good fund in Aberdeen was to be used to uh, build a leisure centre, but that still required capital consent as well as uh, approval under the common good legislation. Now, from a practical point of view, as a local authority and a potential purchaser, or user of property will not want to run the risk of a transaction being challenged at a later date. Authorities are likely to apply to the court if there is a slightest possibility that there is a question as to whether or not we have a right to alienate the land uh, at all. Now, not surprisingly, there is very limited case law about cases in which there isn't such a question because people don't need to go to the court if there isn't a question. But there is authoritative law on case law when land cannot be alienated. And again, there is a quite old but important case where the fourth case, which is on the slide. And there, uh, the court described three ways in which a public use of our property, and for this purposes, this is in an inalienable uh, property because of that public use. And it's appropriated uh, in one of three ways. Firstly, uh, the land may be appropriated to public uses in the charter or original grant. Secondly, the land, after being invested in the public body, may be irrevocably appropriated to public uses by the act of a town council itself. And thirdly, it may be so appropriated, or rather the inference may be drawn, but it was originally appropriated to public uses from evidence the land has been used and enjoyed for time immemorial. So the original charter, a decision by the local authority itself or by public use evidence by use and enjoyment for time immemorial. Now, until recently, the provisions of the 1973 Act were the only ones which specifically govern the disposal and use of common good property. However, the Common Community Empowerment Scotland Act in 2015 intru introduced a consultation process to which I uh, will briefly uh, refer. It's set out in section 104 of the Community Empowerment Scotland Act. It applies when an authority is considering disposing of any property which is held by the authority as part of a common good or changing the use to which any such property is put. And note there is no specific requirement here that this only applies to property which is inalienable. It applies to any uh, common good property according to its uh, terms. And the requirement in this section is to advertise, to inform community councils and community bodies and to make representations, which the council then has to, to consider uh, and uh, decide to respond accordingly. There are details of the process uh, set out in full in section 104, and in guidance, which is in fact statutory guidance published by the uh, Scottish Government. And again, the case of Guild against Angus, a recent case, very important in this respect, also sets out in some detail how Section 104 should be interpreted and applied. And it's important to note that it states uh, there that the terms for example, relating to change of use uh, are ones which are to be seen in the context of the purpose of section 104 to encourage transparency and encouragement of community involvement 
you can't just apply the terms, for example, as they're used in planning legislation and apply them necessarily to the consultation that you have to take, uh, have to undertake under section 104. I put on the slide here a link to a consultation document and as a for transparency, this was a, a case in which I was instructed by the local authority involved, which sets out the type of consultation document that uh, you can produce uh, to support such consultation under the Community Empowerment Act. This particular one was a substantial transfer of property and you can see that from the, from the link. You may not require a consultation document of such length in a smaller uh, transfer request for common good. Uh, that's quite reasonable, but certainly in a complex application for appropriation or disposal of common good property, a comprehensive consultation document is probably desirable, not least because that will probably allow the court to deal more speedily and uh, with no uh, uh, difficulty in presented to your application, as indeed happened in this particular case. So that's uh, all I have to say in the slides. There's a lot more in the notes to which I would refer you. And I would now hand you over to Robert Sutherland to speak about the community right to work. Uh, thanks very much, Mark. Um, so uh, as you see from the first slide, the title is Community Rights to Buy. Um, and uh, then uh, Mark can move the slide on to the next one. Um, so the question is, what are the community rights to buy? Um, there are four uh, statutory community rights to buy. Um, there is the community right to buy land under the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003. There is the crofting community right to buy um, under part three of that act. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about uh, the crofting community right to buy today. I'll be concentrating on the other three uh, community rights. Uh, the third one is the community right to buy abandoned, neglected or detrimental land, um, which was introduced into the 2003 Act and can be found in uh, Part 3 of the 3A of that Act. Uh, and then uh, we have also the right to buy land to further sustainable development set out in uh, Part 5. Um, and uh, as uh, set out in the slide, um, Logan Henderson, uh, amongst other people, have uh, commented that uh, these community rights to buy uh, are considered to be um, radical. Uh, so uh, whether that's the case or not, will uh, as a matter for uh, your own view. But um, looking on at what the community rights to buy do involve or don't involve, um, it should be noted that um, in the first place, in all of the cases, uh, a community right to buy is not intended to either preserve the existing status quo, uh, nor is it uh, intended to uh, stop a landowner from developing their own land uh, or block the development of land by others. Uh, and it's not intended to prevent other uh, people who might be interested in purchasing, purchasing the land uh, as a mechanism to prevent them from doing so. In terms of the uh, original community right to buy under part two uh, of the 2003 Act, uh, it should be noted that it is a preemptive right to buy. Uh, that is, it's not a forced sale of land uh, or involve in any sense a compulsory purchase of land. Uh, it, it must be land which the landowner is willing to sell in the first place. Uh, to that extent, it differs from parts 3A and part five uh, uh, of uh, the uh, other community rights to buy in that uh, these allow community bodies to apply to the Scottish ministers for consent uh, to exercise a right to buy land and where the ministers uh, grant that consent the community body uh, will have the right to do so. Uh, so uh, moving on. Um, answering the next question then um, what is uh, it that you have a right to buy? So looking at part two uh, of the 2003 Act um, the original community right to buy applies to land in respect of which uh, a community interest has been registered. Uh, originally, uh, that was uh, only available uh, to land uh, outside uh, designated settlements with a population of over 10,000, uh, with the result that most of urban Scotland was excluded from its scope. Uh, that has now uh, been changed. That uh, restriction has been removed. Um, Land itself is not a defined term within the Act, but uh, Section 33 
contains a definition of uh, land which is excluded land, uh, which uh, is exempt from uh, purchase. Excluded land is defined as land consisting of separate tenement, which is owned separately from the land in respect of which it is ex exigible. Uh, so uh, section 33 2A um, also then uh, on top of that excludes salmon fishings and other mineral rights um, from the definition of excluded land. Uh, the upshot is that things like salmon fishings uh, and other mineral rights because of that double negative approach uh, are therefore included in the community right to buy. Other rights such as the right to gather uh, mussels and oysters for example would be excluded. Uh, moving on, uh, looking at the right to buy under Part 3A of the 2003 Act, uh, again asking the question, uh, what is it that you're entitled to buy? Uh, you can buy eligible land, uh, and it is eligible land if, in the opinion of uh, the ministers, it is wholly or mainly abandoned or neglected, uh, or the use or management of the land is such that it results in or causes harm directly or indirectly to the environmental well-being of a relevant community. Uh, there are uh, regulations, uh, the community right to buy uh, abandoned, neglected or detrimental land, eligible land, regulate, regulators and restrictions uh, on transfers and dealings, Scotland regulations, um, quite a mouthful as usual in some of these uh, sub-provisions, uh, which set out criteria for deciding applications, uh, for example, the physical condition of the land, the land designations and how land is used or managed. So you do need to consider uh, what designation the land might have. For example, is it a triple SI? Uh, does it have any uh, nature conservation status? Is it in a conservation area or does it have a listed building status? Uh, and any uh, development plans that might uh, relate to that land. Um, how long has the land been in that state? Um, does it pose a risk to public safety? Um, would there be any adverse effect on uh, adjacent land? Uh, arising from its uh, state or condition? Um, could it be a statutory nuisance under the Environmental Protection Act 1990? Um, are there any closure notices or has any other action been taken under the Antisocial Behaviour Scotland Act 2004? These are all relevant questions to ask. Um, what is meant by harm? Uh, harm uh, is defined as ex in an exclusive way, um, meaning uh, a broad range of things uh, could be harm, uh, but it includes um, the environmental effects which have an environmental, uh, which have an adverse effect on, on the lives of persons comprising uh, a relevant community uh, and uh, doesn't include harm, uh, which in the opinion of ministers is negligible. If land is environmentally detrimental, a community body must ask the relevant regulator, for example, SIPA, to take action first to remedy or mitigate the harm. Um, and it must be shown that uh, the harm is unlikely to be removed if the current owner remains as owner of the land. Moving on to the next uh, community right to buy, uh, and again uh, under part five of the 2006 Bean Act, um, what is it that you've got the right to buy? Uh, again, it's uh, land except excluded land, and excluded land um, is uh, then defined as uh, land on which there is building another structure, which is an individual home, um, land uh, pertaining to type of land uh, as uh, mentioned in paragraph A, as may uh, be specified by regulations, it also excludes croft land uh, and um, land which is owned or occupied by the Crown uh, by virtue of having vested in the Crown one of Acantia uh, or having fallen to the Crown uh, as Ultimus Aries. Uh, and again, uh, it's also uh, the Scottish ministers have power to designate other types of uh, land uh, by regulation, uh, and that's been done in uh, the regulations uh, quoted here uh, with uh, more specific exclusions. So uh, that includes, for example, uh, tight uh, accommodation, uh, life rents, uh, land within the curtilage of a home, um, and uh, others. Uh, lands of other similar uses, such as garages, storage areas, garden ground. Uh, the Part 5 right under the 2016 Act does, however, include a, a right to buy a tenant's interest, uh, again, excluding tenancies of crofts, houses, or other types of tenancies specified uh, by ministers, uh, but 
by the Scottish Minister under regulation, uh, as uh, said out before. So who can exercise uh, a community right to buy? Uh, first of all, you've got to be a, a community body. Um, what is a community body? A community body um, is largely uh, defined by reference to a postcode unit uh, or postcode units or a type of area uh, which the Scottish ministers uh, can specify. And again, I've set out um, regulations um, produced by the Scottish ministers, uh, which uh, lists different ways in which uh, a community can be defined. Um, so uh, examples include uh, electoral wards, uh, a community council area, uh, or even an island. Um, a community body uh, has to be uh, either a, a company which is limited by guarantee, uh, a Scottish charitable uh, incorporated organisation uh, known as a SCIO, um, or a community benefit society. Uh, so also noticeable, noticeable that under part five of the 2016 Act, uh, a body may also nominate a third party body as a purchaser if it meets specified requirements. Um, a body which meets the statutory requirements is not a part five community body until the Scottish ministers have given, given written confirmation that they are satisfied that the main purpose of that body is consistent uh, with furthering uh, the achievement of sustainable development. Uh, next slide, please, Mark. Um, so when can uh, a community right to buy uh, be exercised? Uh, first of all, uh, under uh, part two of the 2003 Act, uh, as noted before, a community body has to have uh, registered an interest over the land uh, in the register of community interests in land, uh, which is uh, maintained by uh, the keeper of the registers at Meadowbank House. Uh, under parts 3A of the 2003 Act and part 5 of the 2016 Act, a community body has to uh, register in the register of applications by community bodies to buy land. Um, known as the new register. Uh, so uh, before you can do that, uh, you've got to create your community body and you've got to have defined your community. Um, you've got to have prepared your proposal, um, in, including uh, how that uh, purchase would be financed. And you have to uh, have obtained community support uh, for uh, the intended purchase. Um, now under the uh, part two of the 2003 Act, uh, you normally require to demonstrate at least 10% support um, from your defined community uh, for uh, the uh, exercise of the right to buy uh, that's intended. Um, and the evidence of community support uh, must be um, uh, relatively up to date. So that must be within six months of the date uh, that uh, the application is made uh, to the Scottish ministers. Um, under part 3A of the 2003 Act and part 5 of the 2016 Act, um, uh, you have to have a ballot where at least half of the members of the defined community have voted, um, or if fewer than half, uh, you have to be able to uh, say that the proportion which have voted is sufficient just to justify uh, proceeding to buy the land. Um, and the majority of those voting uh, have to have voted in favour of the proposition uh, that the community body buy the land. So uh, next slide. Uh, looking at then at um, the registration process um, that uh, the community body has to go through, um, this has to be done using uh, a prescribed application form. Um, that form has got a lot of detail in it. Uh, you've got to uh, set out information about the community body, the definition of the community body. Um, you've got to have that in writing. It's also uh, got to be mapped. Um, you've got to have details of the land uh, which uh, you intend to uh, register uh, uh, to purchase and details of the community's connection to that land, uh, the ownership of the land, uh, anyone who's got any legal enforceable rights over the land, such as leases uh, or any uh, creditors, uh, who have a hold the standard security over the land. Um, and uh, if uh, the owners of the land um, can't, uh, aren't known, uh, what steps have been taken by the community body to trace the owners uh, or creditors. Um, you also got to uh, provide details of the community support which has been obtained, um, the I say all the details of the proposals for the land, say, and uh, for example, how the acquisition of the land will be compatible with sustainable development um, or and reasons why it's in the 
the public interest for the Scottish ministers to register the interest in land. Uh, I mentioned maps. Um, again, there are uh, quite detailed uh, provisions about those. Uh, any maps, plans or drawings which are provided uh, must conform to uh, the 2015 regulations uh, and they must show a, a number of uh, matters of detail. So they must contain a map grid reference, uh, such as a four-figure OS um, grid reference. It must include a north scale, must show a map scale, uh, and must show uh, the boundaries of the land uh, and any identifiable uh, neighbouring land um, and the boundary of the community. So um, you can't just uh, register something which uh, on the face of it uh, appears to be just a floating island um, disassociated from anything else. Um, my slide mentions the case of um, Hazel against uh, the Scottish ministers. Um, this was an appeal against uh, the decision of the Scottish minister, ministers to register a community right to buy under part two. Uh, and the issue that was raised was whether the applications uh, were incompetent uh, because they failed to supply with, comply with uh, the uh, regulations in force at, at the time uh, concerning the specification of the map. Um, and that was a result because uh, the uh, plans uh, didn't incl include uh, any OS grid references. Uh, and it was held that that omission of the grid references was fatal uh, and that the Scottish ministers should not have accepted the applications uh, and the keeper was uh, ordered uh, to remove uh, the registrations uh, from the Register of Community Interests and Land. Uh, next slide. Um, now, what happens if uh, an application um, is for registration comes late? Well, um, there's a couple of cases which uh, uh, on this. Um, first of all, uh, the case of Home Hill Limited against Scottish ministers. Uh, Scottish ministers had declined uh, to accept a registration uh, and uh, this was an appeal against that decision. First issue uh, that was considered by the sheriff was uh, whether uh, the uh, sheriff uh, had to consider uh, the appeal uh, based on the merits uh, and uh, therefore uh, the court could make a fresh decision uh, or was it effectively a judicial review type exercise um, and uh, uh, sheriff uh, held that uh, the, real, the question was whether the Scottish ministers had made a decision that was a lawful, lawful and reasonable exercise of their discretion uh, with reference uh, to the policy principles underlying the Act. Um, I won't go into the whole detail uh, of uh, what else the court uh, decided. Uh, it's set out in the slides, which you'll see, uh, and there's also going to be a handout, uh, which also gives uh, some further information. Uh, so the next uh, case is uh, Coastal Regeneration Alliance Limited against the Scottish Ministers. Uh, this uh, involved a disposal of land near Kakenzie Power Station. Um, and uh, the landowner had entered into talks with uh, several third parties with a view to the sale of the land uh, in 2014. And uh, by early 2015, the land was noted in third party development uh, proposals. The Scottish ministers um, declined to consider uh, applications for registration uh, as the landowner had not been correctly identified. Revised applications were put in um, with the intention of pursuing community ownership of the land. Uh, but uh, again, what was fatal was the fact that uh, the proposals for uh, community uh, purchase of the land uh, didn't come to light uh, until uh, after uh, the third party developers had put forward their own proposals for use of the land. Uh, and so this was seen as an application to register an interest, uh, which was intended to stop uh, an alternative uh, use of the land. Um, and it was uh, not a good reason uh, for uh, not submitting uh, uh, a uh, application in time. Um, so moving on. Um, after an application for registration is received, uh, the landowner is notified of the application. Uh, the result of that is that a temporary prohibition is placed on the landowner or creditor, uh, preventing them from taking steps to transfer or dispose of the land. Uh, ministers will consider any comments uh, which are submitted to them, uh, whether to approve or reject the application. 
Um, the prohibition of taking steps to transfer the land uh, also prevents further marketing of the land. It also prevents uh, parties involved from concluding missives if, if they've started that process uh, or entering into uh, option agreements which haven't yet been finalised. Um, not all uh, transfers, however, uh, are prohibited. Um, certain there are exceptions to uh, that. Um, so the transfers which can go ahead are transfers by way of a gift uh, or transfers in implement of a court order. Um, should be noted that there are some exceptions to that. Uh, transfers uh, between spouses or civil partners and implement of an agreement which was entered into uh, before the registration application was made. Uh, transfers between group companies, uh, transfers to a statutory undertaker uh, for the purpose of their undertaking, uh, transfers under compulsory purchase powers uh, or transfers under another uh, community right to buy. Uh, also, uh, where missives have already been concluded or an option uh, to purchase uh, uh, has already been created uh, before uh, the application appeared on the uh, register, uh, those uh, can go ahead. Uh, and also uh, any transfers involving uh, an assumption, death or resignation of a partner in a firm uh, or a trustee in a trust, um, and also uh, where the property has uh, vested in uh, trustee in sequestration uh, in bankruptcy um, or uh, in a, as a judicial factor. So uh, next slide. Um, Again, after registration, if the landowner intends to purchase the land, he requires to offer the community body the opportunity to purchase the land if the registration is accepted. Uh, if the community body decides to proceed, the Scottish ministers will appoint and pay for an independent valuer. Um, uh, will then be a, a ballot uh, to uh, uh, confirm uh, that the purchase uh, should go ahead uh, and a community body must submit um, the result of the ballot to the Scottish Ministers. Next slide, please. Um, under part three and part of the 2003 Act and part five of the 2016 Act, um, the landowner is asked to agree to the community body's request to transfer the land to them. If the landowner doesn't respond or doesn't agree, um, then uh, the community body can apply to the Scottish Ministers for consent to exercise the right to buy. And if that's granted by the Scottish ministers, then the owner must sell the land um, to the community body or potentially in the case of uh, part five of the 2016 Act, uh, the third party purchaser. Um, uh, a decision of the Scottish ministers can be appealed um, and uh, the sale uh, as at a, either at a value agreed by uh, between the owner and the community body uh, or at market value. Uh, so there's a lot more information available. Uh, a lot of it is online. Um, uh, I've uh, given information here about uh, where some of the information can be found. Um, the second bullet point um, is a reference to uh, what's called a root map. Um, it's an extremely complicated uh, drawing. Um, it wouldn't be possible to replicate it um, in a sort of PowerPoint slide like this. Um, if you uh, want to look at it and try and understand it, I recommend that you print it out on a sheet of A3 paper uh, at the very least. Um, and uh, some more information is available uh, through uh, the uh, web Gateway website, uh, which I've noted uh, on my last slide. And I'll hand back to Mark. Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Robert. And if you want to talk about, uh, Robert, about our presentations, you should put them in the Q&A box and we'll try and deal with as many as we can at the end of the session. So asset transfer. Uh, the right for community organisations to request for transfer of public assets in Scotland was introduced under the 2015 Community Empowerment Act. Uh, there is detailed, very detailed, statutory guidance for authorities and how they should um, respond to applications and indeed encourage applications for asset transfer. There's also extensive uh, regulations about the scheme as well, and these are described in full in my notes. But the essence of the uh, scheme uh, is that they 
it allows a community transfer body to make an asset transfer request to a relevant authority. And it's important to emphasize that the legislation and the guidance represent a clear policy intention to encourage extensive asset transfer. Relevant authorities are expected to be supportive and proactive in facilitating asset transfer. Uh, and part of this uh, is to uh, help community bodies to identify suitable assets. And that's one of the reasons why the Act requires authorities, relevant authorities, to establish and maintain a register of land. It should be emphasized though, just as with the register of common good land, which I described in my earlier talk, uh, and there's obviously some overlap between the two, um, if it's a local authority that's involved, the register is not a definitive list of land for which an asset transfer request can be made. The regulations do allow some land to be excluded from the list. That's mainly things like um, uh, roads, underground railways, bus stations, housing, things which uh, uh, the legislation doesn't expect to be successful applications for asset transfer. But the list is not definitive and you can still apply uh, for asset transfer, even if the area of land is not on the register, as long as it, as it is actually land owned by the relevant authority. But clearly, if you try and put in a request for an underground railway, you're not likely to get very far, I suggest, with your application. So the first requirement is that there is a community transfer body that makes a request. Well, a community transfer body is defined in section 19 of the Act, sorry, a community, it's, it's defined in the Act as either a community control body or another body or class of bodies designated by Scottish ministers. And in fact, the bodies that have been designated are the ones which have been designated as having the community right to buy, of a crofting community right to buy under the land reform measures, which uh, Robert has just been speaking about. But in most cases, the community transfer body will be a body which is a community controlled body, which is a main category of bodies that are able to make asset transfers requests. And I've put up on the slide section 19, which uh, defines a community controlled body. It's important points to note. Uh, the majority of members of a body uh, must be members of that community um, and members of a body uh, uh, must, uh, the members of the body who are members of a community ha actually have control of a body. You can't just have lots of people in the community but have it run by somebody else. It has to be members of that community who have control of it. It's open to all members of that community uh, and uh, there is the costing provision for surplus funds or assets uh, on wind up to be applied for the benefit of the community. And what is really important for asset transfer is that unlike the community right to buy land, which Robert has referred to, um, the Act for the purposes of asset transfer does not define community. And moreover, guidance makes it clear that a community does not have to be defined by geography, but can also be a community of interest. Uh, there are some examples given in more detail in the guidance, but I highlight ones which are mentioned. It can be faith groups ethnic groups, people affected by a particular illness or disability, sports clubs, conservation groups, clan and heritage associations, etc. as the guidance says. Uh, the asset transfer should be judged on the benefits it will deliver, not the community it represents, but the authorities may take into account the impact on other groups uh, who might be affected by an asset transfer. Again, important to emphasize that the bodies may be large or small, they can be local, national, they can even be international bodies. But again, uh, the uh, guidance legislation makes it clear that there has to be uh, uh, control by relevant members uh, of that organization if an asset transfer is to be uh, uh, su successful. A lot more, as I said, in the guidance, which uh, uh, you should look at if you're interested in this uh, question. 
So a community transfer body can make an asset transfer request. It can make a transfer request in relation to any land owned or leased by the relevant authority. And again, in the Act, land is defined as including buildings and other structures on the land. The community transfer body can ask to buy the land or to lease the land or for other rights over the land, e.g., as the guidance says, to use it for a particular purpose. So you may, for example, have a sports group which just wants to use a football pitch for Sunday football. You may want someone who wants to use a concert hall for some uh, regular occasion. So there's a whole range of requests which can be made by a community transfer body. Uh, it should also be noted that if a community transfer body, so it's uh, abbreviation, CTB, makes an asset transfer request for ownership, it does have to be incorporated as a limited company, a SKU, a community benefit company, with a minimum of 20 members. If it's a company, it must have specific provisions on winding up uh, any outstanding property and other satisfactory liabilities. It probably passes to another appropriate body. And of course, if it's a SKU or a community benefit company, it will have that kind of provision in its articles anyway. But that's only the position with requests for ownership. You don't need to be incorporated if you want to uh, lease or you want rights over the land. And that's again designed to make the process available to relatively small or informally constituted organisations as long as they meet the basic requirements. Relevant authorities, uh, who can you ask for uh, a transfer of assets? Well, I've highlighted some of the ones listed, but there's a, a longer list which I've set out in the slides. The important point to bear in mind is that there are substantial areas of public assets within Scotland, which are in principle subject to an asset transfer request. But it's important to bear in mind, as the last line of this slide indicates, that this does not apply to UK government departments and agencies or private bodies or NGOs. Uh, this is, of course, because it's Scottish legislation, therefore the Scottish government could not uh, uh, make uh, legislation in regard to UK government uh, departments in this respect. NGOs is mentioned because there are bodies, for example, like the National Trust for Scotland, which some people believe is a public body, but it, which is in fact a, not a, a public body. So those are excluded from the right to request uh, a transfer. The process for making access to transfer request is again set out in some detail in the guidance and again to emphasize the starting point is that it's expected that there be discussion and negotiation about possible transfer requests the community transfer body is expected to do that and equally the local authorities sorry the relevant authorities not just local authorities again to emphasize the relevant authority is meant to facilitate help them assist them with those discussions as well and I suspect in many cases, the existence of legislation has led to discussions taking place which have resulted in assets being transferred we, without the official transfer process under the legislation actually having been started. But if there was no voluntary agreement, then again, there are provisions in the Act and in regulations about how this is to happen. But in essence, the community transfer body makes a request setting out various necessary information uh, the reason of making requests of benefits or proposals under price that is prepared to pay. It's actually a very long list of um, information which has to be provided, which uh, I know that some community transfer bodies have felt is a bit uh, um, discouraging uh, of requests, but there it is. That's, uh, that's, that's there in the regular. The knowledge of a credit may be made. The authority must not sell, lease, otherwise dispose of a land to anyone else until the whole process is completed with some qualifications, which again are in the legislation. The authority issues a decision notice, which should include its reasons for agreeing or refusing. If the authority agrees to request, a contract is then negotiated with the transfer body. The community transfer body has a right of appeal or review if the request is refused. There's a different procedure for how you appeal or review depending upon whether the relevant authority is a local authority, the Scottish Minister, the Scottish Government or another body, but ultimately the roots of the appeal process end up with the Scottish Ministers who make the final decision, which is final, 
subject only, of course, to the right of uh, judicial review. When they make a decision, an authority has to take into consideration a number of matters, reasons for the request, uh, other information, whether it's likely to promote or improve economic development, regeneration, public health, social well-being or environmental well-being, whether agreeing to request would like to reduce inequalities of outcome due to socioeconomic disadvantage, any other benefits that might arise if a request were agreed to, any benefits that might arise if the authority were to agree to an alternative proposal and how they would compare to any benefits such as mentioned earlier in the, uh, in the uh, section, how benefits could relate to other matters the authority has considered relevant, in particular the functions and purposes of the authority. So you can, for example, if you're asked to transfer, say a sports uh, pavilion, to consider how it may affect your ability to meet your functions in terms of leisure and recreation, if you, again, if you're a local authority, and again, it's not just local authorities that uh, this applies to. Um, subsection four, the authority must exercise the function in a manner which encourages equal opportunities and in particular the observance of the equal opportunity requirements and very importantly subsection five the authority must must agree to the request unless there are reasonable grounds for refusing it so the default position is that the authority must agree to the request unless there are reasonable grounds for refusing it. again to underline the policy objectives behind the legislation which I referred to uh, earlier on. Uh, I have put in my handout uh, some links with further information, including the Scottish Government uh, website on community transfer. I've also made reference to the um, Community Ownership Support Service, which provides support mainly to community bodies, but can also provide advice to relevant authorities on asset transfer. Uh, and again, I mentioned in my handout that subst substantial government and other funding is also available to support asset transfer. With that, I now hand the floor over to Robert. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, we're now open uh, for uh, questions. Um, at the moment, we have uh, no questions uh, posted. I don't know, I'll give people a couple of minutes uh, to see if uh, anyone wants to uh, post a question. Uh, if not, Robert, perhaps I could uh, highlight one point I left out of my slide to- Yeah, uh, please do, Mark. Uh, to uh, keep in the time limits, but it's, again, it's, it's in the note, just to emphasize that the Act doesn't have any provisions talking about asset transfer now, um, what price is to be paid for purchase, lease, or use of another asset? It can um, be transferred or the community body can request for transfer at, uh, indeed, uh, indeed for nil price or at a, uh, a subsidy, uh, a no, uh, at a, a discounted price. But there are provisions in the Act about how you should go about valuation and the guidance does allow relevant authorities to take steps to protect the discount. So that if the asset is transferred at a discount um, uh, below market value, and for any reason, the asset transfer arrangements don't uh, work out as was promised by the community transfer body, the, uh, the authority can do something about uh, the uh, transfer to effectively recover the discount or indeed recover the asset. So I think that's one point which I think is important to bear in mind uh, when uh, considering how to deal with asset transfer requests. Uh, okay, thanks very much, Mark. Um, we've got um, one comment, uh, one from Elspeth Matheson, um, thanking us for mentioning the Community Ownership Support Service. Um, uh, uh, just say that they are available uh, for questions from solicitors as well as from community groups and uh, relevant authorities. So that's useful information uh, for people to know. Um, uh, question one question um, do local authorities have to notify and consult with all community councils within the area when disposing of common good land uh, or uh, just community councils within the area of the property being uh, disposed so uh, that's a question for uh, mark yeah that's uh, set out in section 104 which is actually in the handout but uh, in brief that 
they have to consult uh, with a community council whose area consists of or includes the area um, or part of the area to which a property um, um, related uh, prior to reorganization 75. So it's basically community council covering all or part of the area of a former borough concerned. Um, and that there's again an exception that if you're in Aberdeen, Edinburgh, um, Glasgow or Dundee, then you have to uh, consult any community council in the entire authority area. In addition, there's also a requirement to consult any community body which is known by the authority to have an interest in the property. But apart from the four uh, older cities, then it's just the community councils covering all or part of the, of the borough in which the local government, uh, the common good property was, uh, was situated, was situated. Uh, right, thank you. Uh, and, and another question for you, Mark. Um, for a community asset transfer, um, once the contract is concluded, is that just dealt with as a contract from there on, or is there still any sort of statutory control over that? Well, um, assuming about the contract, as it, as it would do, it also includes agreement on the price and the financial terms, then uh, as far as I can recall, um, that, that, is, that is the end of a process, um, uh, and uh, unless for any reason, as I indicated, the uh, um, community transfer body cannot meet conditions placed upon it, in which case it then can come back, as it were, to the provisions of the 2015 statute. But basically, once it's uh, uh, concluded, uh, that's the uh, uh, that's the statutory control under the 2015 uh, Act. Uh, include obviously there may be planning um, provisions required if someone does something to a building which has been transferred. Clearly, but uh, in essence, the contract concludes the control from the 2015 Act. Right. Um, and there's a further question uh, this time directed at me. Uh, how many community right to buy applications have been made so far? Um, to be honest, I'm afraid, uh, and one asks how many part five community, all oh right, the correction to that first question, how many part five community right to buy applications have been made so far? Um, to be honest, I don't know if uh, the answer to that question. Um, the, uh, so, uh, it, there may be information about that um, on um, the Scottish government's website somewhere uh, and another uh, potential uh, place uh, that might uh, have that kind of information uh, would be uh, the Scottish Land Commission's website, but I haven't specifically checked um, how many um, we need to write to buy applications have actually um, gone through uh, either generally or uh, specifically in relation to any of the individual parts. So, um, sorry, uh, I'm not able to be very helpful on that. Um, do we have any more questions? Oh. Um, right, in relation, rather, I think this one is for me, in relation to community right to buy, it was noted that there's compulsory purchase element in both part 3A and part 5. Our community group was advised by government this is not the case with section 3 Part 3A, this was of interest as we had a Part 2 registration, which could not be carried forward as the owner uh, did not uh, engage uh, with uh, the process. Uh, right. Um, sorry. That question uh, says, right, yes, that question refers to Part, uh, compuls what I said about uh, part 3A and part 5, um, uh, the indication being that uh, there was a sort of compulsory element to that um, uh, if, if the community right to buy was accepted. Um, uh, and then it goes on to say we had a part 2 registration which could not be carried forward as the owner did not engage with the process. Could you kindly confirm? Um, as far as uh, to, 
best of my knowledge, what I said was entirely correct in that um, uh, parts 3A and part 5 um, can in, it do involve a right to buy in situations where the landowner has not uh, previously indicated an intention to try and sell the property. Um, uh, and if uh, the registration uh, process uh, is successful, then uh, the uh, and the seller uh, and the landowner refuses to sell, then the Scottish ministers uh, could be asked uh, to uh, uh, grant uh, the right to buy. Um, but uh, if it's under part two of, of the 2003 Act, um, then um, that requires uh, the uh, uh, seller to be willing to sell in the first place and the community right to buy only exists um, where the seller's um, intending to sell the property. Um, and uh, I think I'd have to know more details about um, what uh, happened um, in that particular application um, as to why, uh, if the owner didn't engage with the process, uh, what exactly the problem was. Um, there's a helpful piece of information from Elspeth Matheson uh, commenting on uh, the last question for Mark, um, which says that, uh, so far as she knows, there have been no part five applications which have been successful yet. Uh, Isn't that for you, Robert, I think? Well, that, oh, sorry, yes, you're right, that is for me. Um, right, do we have any other Questions then. Uh, right, that looks like it. Uh, I think so. Uh, all that remains for me is to say um, thanks very much to Mark for his contribution. Um, thank you very much to uh, the uh, staff at Terra Firma Chambers for uh, their uh, assistance in uh, putting on these seminars and more. Importantly, uh, thank you for uh, all of you who have uh, registered and have uh, attended today uh, and to watch, uh, listen and uh, ask questions. Um, I hope you've enjoyed today's presentation uh, and as I've said before, uh, there are uh, more presentations being put on uh, under this series and you can get further information from that on the Terra Firma Chambers uh, website, Terra Firma Chambers. Dot com. Thanks very much. I'll sign off now.